called into the office and you exercise your line guard rights. Some people in, in management may take that as an escalation. They may assume that you've done something or that there's some reason to be suspicious. What to do if you're called into a meeting by your boss? And this is a little bit of a preview of the type of material we're going to be doing on our new weekly episode, um, which is tentatively titled Shop Talk. And so what we're going to be doing on Shop Talk is a deep dive on labor history and a deep dive on labor education and training, right? So we'll keep the newsier stuff for uh, our regular Saturday Valley Labor Report, more online stuff for our overtime. Uh, but Shop Talk is going to be more of an educational experience focused on labor history and focused on training. I want the idea is that, you know, at least maybe once a month, an episode of Shop Talk would be very appropriate for shop stewards to send out or for officers to send out to their stewards. Uh, we want it to be something very practical, tangible that, you know, you can you can take away and share with other members of your union or in some cases uh, with your coworkers, even if you don't have a union, uh, still want to have information and resources that will be helpful for you to defend yourself and your coworkers in the workplace, union or not. So with all that said, um, you know, if that's the type of thing you're interested in, if you'd like to learn more about uh, being an advocate for yourself in the workplace or an advocate for others, stay tuned for Shop Talk. Uh, and we will have regular content along those lines. And where we're starting today is what to do if you are called into the boss's office. Um, what happens next? What if it's an investigation? What if you're in trouble? The answer will depend on a lot of different variables involved. Uh, so if you are a worker, you're called into the boss's office. If you reach out to me, a couple of the first questions I'm going to need to know is, well, where do you work? What kind of workplace is it? Do you have a union in your workplace? Are you a public school employee? Or are you in a non-union private sector uh, workplace? You know, there's, there's different legal frameworks depending on which kind of uh, workplace you're in. So the answers to what to do when you're called into the boss's office is going to largely be based on on that, you know, the type of uh, workplace you're in. So for everybody listening, there are things that you can do to protect yourself uh, and advice that you could also share with your coworkers, regardless of, you know, industry or union representation. Uh, but obviously, if you do have union representation, you have more recourse when it comes to a boss asking to meet with you, investigate you, or discipline you. So for those of you in your union workplace, you're in a union shop, you have a union that you're a member of, you get to exercise your wine garden rights. This is your official right to request representation. In a union environment, your contract is going to determine how much due process you have at work. Uh, but when it comes to a disciplinary meeting, if the boss calls you in to ask you tough questions about your performance, you can exercise your wine garden rights. You can ask that you have the meeting rescheduled or postponed until such a time that your union rep is available. And uh, the employer doesn't get to determine who that representative is, right? It's typically it's going to be, you know, your steward. Uh, but depending on how your union is structured, how your workplace is structured, it could be somebody else. It could be a staffer of the union, um, or it could be, uh, you know, just a coworker that you go to, frankly. Uh, so, you know, to serve as basically like a witness. Um, my background with this is primarily in the public school setting as the, uh, local field staffer with the Alabama Education Association. I frequently accompany members in disciplinary meetings and investigatory meetings. Um, 
public schools in Alabama have a little di bit different uh, rights to that right to representation, which I'll address in a second. Uh, but every one of you has some some things that you can do. But if you are in a union shop, that's ideal. Have your rep sit in on the meeting uh, and it's, you know, it's going to help you. It's going to prevent you from digging yourself a hole that you maybe can't get out of. And when I'm talking about being called into the boss's office, uh, the expectation is that like something bad could happen from it, right? Um, if your boss is calling you in for a casual conversation, pick your battles, right? You know, I had some members that had such an adversarial relationship with their supervisor that it got to the point where they didn't want to have any conversation with them without me or another representative present. And, you know, it's a shame that it gets to that point, first of all, but it's also impractical. And, and in some cases, you know, a boss wanted to just have like a basic conversation, like they needed to relay information to the employee uh, or ask some very basic questions that were not, you know, going to lead to trouble. Um, and so, I'll say that you, you, you should pick and choose your battles on that. Um, if you're a, a union member, you've been called into the office and you exercise your wine garden rights, some people in, in management may take that as an escalation. They may assume that you're, you know, you've done something or that there's some reason to be suspicious. Of course, you know, we can all say that they shouldn't do that, right? It's your right. You should exercise that right. And uh, to exercise that right is not an admission of guilt or, you know, an admission that you've, you have any reason to be concerned. But, you know, we're talking about human beings. And, and the reality is that some of those human beings on the other side of the table will take it that way. So, as I mentioned, due process is not exactly uh, going to be the same for every worker. It's going to depend on the contract that you have in your work site. If you don't have a contract, well then it's gonna be based on a collection of laws and you know whatever the policies of the company are. But keep in mind, company policies are, are not set in stone, right? Um, if at-will employment is the default, even if your company has some policies that gives you some degree of you know, due process above and beyond that, uh, it's not unusual for companies to ignore that policy when they so choose. And uh, you'll find lawyers uh, do not have a lot of success in holding companies to those policies. At least in my experience, certainly in a state like Alabama, where the default judge is going to be pro-employer. So having due process just means that you have some form of procedure and steps that have to be followed before you can be disciplined, whether that's a suspension or, you know, even a full on termination. So that's different than at will employment. At will employment's the default for most workers in most industries outside of a union contract. It's that is the law of the land in Alabama. Uh, at will employees can be disciplined or fired for any legal reason. And what that means in practice versus theory is, is important. Uh, we can all say that at-will employees can be fired for any legal reason. We can assume that means there are illegal reasons. And that's true, right? Just because you have no due process, just because you're an at-will employee, you cannot be fired for your race, your ethnicity, your gender your religion, your immigration status, any protected category, federally protected category under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act. You know, you, you are not supposed to be fired for those reasons. Right? You're not supposed to be fired for a discriminatory reason. So it's not as if employers just can do literally anything, but in practice, let's say you are fired as an at-will employee and you believe it is discriminatory in nature, right? It's because of whatever identity you have, a category that you, you fall under. How are you going to prove that? 
that is is the the burden of evidence is extreme um i once had a lawyer tell me in reference to an at will employee that the only way he thought the judge would agree it was discriminatory is if <laughs> is if the words came up off the page and literally slapped him in the courtroom that was the only way it was going to happen uh right so unless you have uh your management on videotape or in an email explicitly explicitly saying we are going to fire this person because they are insert category here uh you're going to find you have a very tough time so you still have your rights you still have the right to pursue an eeoc charge and absolutely if you think something like that has happened you should uh but there's a reason why unions fight so hard to have due process uh because it just it helps to level the playing field there's just so much room for malfeasance in at will employee in at will employment it gives the employers way too too much power so you know that's all context for being called into a meeting you have to know what your due process is you have to know that your your status uh, because that's going to help you determine how you respond. If you're an at-will employee, you don't have a union rep, you know, maybe you don't enter that meeting like a bat out of hell, ready to fight, unless you're prepared for what could come next. Um, one thing that you can do, regardless of your employment status, your your union status, is in the meeting... The meeting itself you the employee who's being questioned you can record the meeting check your state laws but in alabama we are a one-party consent state that means only one party to the recording has to consent and it can be you who presses record so that was one tip i passed along to my members like hey if if i can't be in the meeting with you you get ambushed Right, because supervisors love to do those ambush meetings to catch you off guard, to prevent you from talking to your union. You know, if you're caught in that situation, you can record the meeting. Could be very helpful. Um, I recommend taking notes during the meeting. Have out pen and paper, old school. I really, really recommend that uh, for a couple reasons. One, it's important to have notes, and you're going to forget stuff. Especially if you are being grilled by your boss, it's going to be a stressful situation. You're not going to remember everything once you walk out that door, right? So taking some notes can help you retain the facts that are relevant and important. And the second thing is that it allows you to help control the flow of the meeting. You can slow it down and say, hold on, let me, let me write this down. I need you to repeat that. Right? You, can, you can slow the meeting down a little bit. You can shift the flow of the meeting. And it's not you trying to uh, do anything improper. You're just trying to take your notes. You're just trying to jot down important details. What might you jot down? Well, who is in the meeting? Who all is in the meeting and what is their title? What is their position? What do they do? Um, why are they in there? Like that's, that's a very important part of the meeting notes. Uh, your meeting notes should also indicate the time and date of the meeting and where the meeting was held. Was it in boss such and such's office or was it in the human resources department? Uh, where, was it in you know a break room? Where, where did the meeting occur? Uh, those are all very important notes to have. And of course, you're going to want to uh, jot down the best you can the questions that you were asked. You want to be able to keep track of what it was that they were investigating you for or what it was they were accusing you of. So that's a little bit about your notes and, and how to proceed with that. Um, when you're in the meeting and you're responding, my advice would be to speak truthfully but concisely. You don't want to lie. You don't want to be dishonest. But you also don't want to share more information than is really necessary. Uh, and that can be one of the tripwires is you get to talking and you start saying more than you probably should. Um, that's why having a rep in your meeting can be very handy, right? Because your rep can, you know, give you the nudge, 
kick you under the table, give you the signal on the table to pipe down. Uh, that is something that if you're by yourself, if you're flying solo, you're not in a union or you don't have a union rep available, you know, that just takes a lot of self-control. And that's where, again, taking notes can help you because you're trying to focus on the notes and keeping track of the conversation without letting yourself get too caught up in the conversation. So speak truthfully, but concisely. Answer direct questions, but don't volunteer answers to questions that were never asked. All right, that's very important. After you leave the meeting with your boss, it's not over. Uh, in fact, it's just started really because whatever is to come is still to come from, from management, whether that's a suspension or termination or uh, you know, further investigation, whatever the situation may be. Uh, so when you get done with the meeting, as soon as it is possible, as soon as it is possible, uh, you need to do like an after meeting to-do list. Some of that is gonna be finalizing your notes, making sure your notes are in order, making sure you have a copy of those notes. Uh, if those notes only exist on pen and paper in that one notebook, you need to type it up, email it to yourself using your personal email, not your company email. Uh, you could also take a picture of the notes. However you do it, do it, you know, whatever method works for you, but ensure that you have copies of an easily accessible copy of these notes. Uh, and the flip side to it is to make sure it's easily accept, accessible to you, not to your management, right? So I, I strongly advise you don't do this sort of thing through your, your work email. Your work email does not belong to you, it belongs to work. And so anything of a sensitive nature about your own employment situation or any trouble you may be in, you don't want that discussed on work email. So your after meeting to-do list is you, you wrap up your notes. If you recorded the meeting, well, then you'll need to go back and do something with that recording. If nothing else, test it out, make sure it did record and this, the audio is actually usable. Uh, you, you know, unfortunately, I've had situations where I went in and recorded the whole meeting, but because of the way it was sitting in my pocket or, you know, whatever the, the space in between the people talking, you know, play the recording and it's just garbage. It's totally unusable. So that's, that's a danger you have if you're relying totally on a recording. Unless you're super, super sure it's going to be high quality and, you know, everything's going to go off without a hitch, you might want to have your backup plan of taking some notes old school. Um, once you have your notes in order, you have your recording in order, if you have a union, you want to talk with your union about what occurred, right? Whoever your, your sort of immediate level representative may be in your situation, a steward, uh, a building representative, uh, you know, perhaps it's an officer or a staff member, but you know, you want to talk to your rep about what transpired in the meeting if they weren't there. Uh, and you can, of course, provide them a copy of your notes uh, and hold on to that as well. Uh, and the most important thing after that meeting, once you've got your, your notes in order, is to monitor what happens next, right? Because if it's an investigation, there's going to be more to the, the process. At some point, the investigation will conclude. Um, if it was a disciplinary meeting, do you have a copy of the disciplinary documents that were being discussed? And, you know, where does it go next? Is there a process? What is the process? You know, did you receive a disciplinary write-up, a written reprimand in the meeting itself? Or is that written reprimand coming at the next meeting, right? That, that's the sort of thing you gotta, you gotta just strategize on where you're at on their timeline. And it is their timeline to some degree. You should know what the timeline is in fact, in policy, in law. Right. Just like, for example, you know, the 180 day deadline for EEOC cases, you need to know that and you will be held to any deadlines that are out there. 
But just know that because a company has a policy that says, you know, we'll respond to grievances in 10 days, doesn't necessarily mean they're going to respond in 10 days, right? And, and, you know, this was certainly the case with the public school district I was working with, uh, where if we missed a timeline, it was definitely a big problem. But if they missed a timeline, eh, what are we going to do, right? They would just challenge us. They would just see how far they could push it. So I've told you a little bit about what to do when you're in a meeting, how to handle being in meetings with your boss. Um, if you are in a union workplace, you exercise your wine garden rights. That is very important. Uh, these rights have been upheld for, for decades now at this point. Um, if you're not in a union workplace, well, I mean, you don't have a rep to go to per se. Um, you know, the classic, the classic thing to say when you're exercising your wine garden rights is if this discussion could in any way lead to my being disciplined or terminated or affect my personal working condition, I respectfully request that my union representative or steward be present at the meeting. Without representation, I choose not to answer any questions. I further request reasonable time to consult with my union representative regarding the subject and purpose of the meeting. I shall not consent to any searches or tests affecting my person, property, or effects without first consulting with my union representative. It is good for you to know that. It's good for you to say that. And many unions have that print something to that effect printed on the back of their business cards. Uh, if your local does not have information about the wine garden rights, if you don't have that easily distributed to your members, that's something you can put on your to-do list. Whatever committee you're on, whatever role you have in the union, if your members are not getting something that shares their wine garden rights, uh, put that on your to-do list. That's very important. It's very important that your members know the rights that they have on the job and the way in which the union plays a role in enforcing those rights. Uh, and so the last thing I'll say on this is that uh, public school employees in Alabama are somewhere in between the totally non-union and the total union uh, dynamics. Public school employees in Alabama have a right to representation, but it is not solidified in law. It is not uh, you know, as rock solid as the wine garden rights that private sector union members have. It's based on some older case law that, um, you know, let's just say it's tenuous. And right, so you have to pick and choose your battles, particularly as a public school employee, on your right to representation because there's only so far you can take it. Uh, you absolutely should request a rep. You absolutely should request the meeting be rescheduled to when you can have a rep if the rep's not present. But do know, if you absolutely refuse to have the meeting without your representative, uh, you could be opening yourselves up to an insubordination charge. So that's something you, you have to keep in mind. If you are a public school teacher in Alabama, you don't have the same wine garden rights that your you know, wife or husband may have at their union shop. You have something like that. Uh, but it's not nearly as definitive, and if push comes to shove, you might not win that fight. So keep that in mind. Know your right to request the representation. Exercise your right to re uh, request representation. If representation is not available or feasible because of the union status or because of the industry you're in, you can still protect yourself by recording the meeting, by taking notes, by doing some after meeting homework and monitoring how management responds. You can still do some protection there. And those notes you need to keep up with because as you go through your journey, whatever that journey may be and wherever that journey may end, if that journey does end in some form of discipline and uh, some negative consequences for you, those notes from the meeting very well may be the basis for your grievance. It could be the basis for an EEOC charge. 
uh, an unfair labor practice, whatever the situation may be. So that's a little bit about what to do if you've been called into the boss's office. Uh, that's a very casual uh, discussion of the topic. Uh, on Shop Talk, we will be going a little bit more in depth. We'll we'll do uh, we'll have some more guests on. This one we just wanted to kind of talk about and share some tips and tricks, uh, but nothing too, you know, too formal or official. Uh, but on Shop Talk, we do intend to, to get a little deeper with some of these. Uh, so, for example, I intend to invite some attorneys on uh, to talk about the EEOC process, what a discrimination charge looks like, how the law defines discrimination. Uh, but we also want to talk about ways in which stewards can be effective in organizing in their local um, anything that may be educational in nature the type of training that you hope your unions are providing or that you wish your union was providing so any ideas you have any questions you have any tips you have anything you would like us to address in the educational component of this new show definitely let us know we're all ears you just saw a clip from the Valley Labor Report. We are live every Saturday morning from 9.30 a.m. till 12.30 p.m. And we pride ourselves on keeping all of our content free to everybody so that we can talk to as many working folks as possible. If you support the work that we're doing, you think that it's important, you think that it's good, then consider making a monthly contribution to the project. And you can do that on our website, tvlr.fm.